Slow Burn Media and Bill Huffman present this week's episode of Who Killed, sponsored by True Crime XS, with my guest, John, the host and producer of True Crime XS, a podcast that features the case of Israel Keys. Trail of Terror, a closer look at the secret stash of weapons serial killer Israel Keys left behind. A killer stash of murderous paraphernalia. Good evening, I'm George Mallet. Steph's off tonight. Investigators say Israel Keys had a so-called murder kit. Keys strategically hit a box filled with weapons and tools used to kill Bill and Lorraine Courier near the Winooski River. Keys traveled the country from Alaska to Vermont looking for people to kill totally at random and funding his crimes by robbing banks. Keys was arrested in Texas in March after using Koenig's stolen debit card. He made her turn out the lights, climbed through the window, and tied her hands behind her back. Barely a minute later, you can see Keyes gripping Koenig as they walk towards his truck. The FBI says Keyes sexually assaulted, killed, and dismembered Koenig. Her body was found in a lake north of Anchorage two months later. Keyes left kill kits other places as well. He told investigators he left the kits in Washington State, Wyoming, and Texas, and planned to hide one in Arizona. Keyes confessed to eight murders. Investigators think, though, he may be responsible for other unsolved cases. He left kill kits or caches buried in several states filled with everything he'd need to commit a murder. Dates and locations since 2001 when they believe he may have killed repeatedly. There is nothing probably greater than holding the power and control of someone's life and looking him in the eye and being able to control all of that is intoxicating to serial killers. And that's why they keep doing it. He was very meticulous, he was very organized, he was very, he definitely planned everything that he did. The FBI also released surveillance video of Samantha Koenig in the Anchorage, Alaska coffee shop where Keyes abducted her last February. They recovered uh, Bill and Lorraine Courier's gun and uh, pieces of the, uh, what turned out to be the murder weapon. The FBI released the tapes of Keyes in the hopes that someone would recognize him and provide more information about him. The newly released tapes granting an astonishing look at the twisted mind of a serial killer. From Jack the Ripper to John Wayne Gacy, murderers who seem to choose their victims at random both terrify and fascinate us simply because they defy moral logic. It was the disappearance of an 18-year-old Alaskan girl that led police to unravel one such killer's astounding 11-year killing spree. George, a federal investigator, told me Keyes was in the Northeast visiting family back in April 2009 when he came to Vermont to stash the murder kit. Today, we saw the spot Keyes hid the cash he would use over two years later to kill the couriers. Eight confirmed murders and rapes, including a couple in Essex, Vermont, four others in Washington State, and one more on the East Coast with the body hidden in New York. Sunday, they found his body. He killed himself with a razor inside his jail cell. Very chilling to hear him talk about what he's done. I think there's a substantial likelihood that he would have killed again if he had remained a, a free. You're watching 34-year-old Israel Keys describe over coffee and a bagel his strategy for hunting and killing innocent people. And if I was smart, I would let them come to me. This remote area. Hello and welcome to episode 62 of Who Hill. I am your host, Bill Huffman, and this is a Slow Burn Media production. This week's episode is actually a guest-sponsored episode from True Crime XS, and they are a true crime podcast that focuses on probably one of the most fascinating cases in the past decade. As I mentioned earlier, they focus on Israel Keys and the connections that he may have had to a number of victims unknown to investigators. I had the privilege of interviewing the host and producer of True Crime Excess, John, and we had a great conversation about his show and where the podcast series is headed. He's the expert on this case, so let's jump into this week's sponsored interview with John of True Crime Excess. And while you're listening, why don't you guys head over to wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe, because this is a podcast that I find extremely interesting, and I believe all of you will as well, if you haven't found it already. But again, it's available wherever 
you get your favorite podcasts. So let's listen to my conversation with John about True Crime Excess and Israel Keys. I am very lucky to be joined this week with John from True Crime Excess, and it is a newer podcast on the podcast front, and it definitely is dealing with one of the more serious true crime stories that uh, has crossed everyone's path in the last decade or so. And I am lucky enough to say hi, John. How are you today? I am doing well. How are you, sir? I am doing so well, and it is great that my lawn service has decided to show up on this beautiful day (laughs) to cut the lawn during my interview. So I am very happy about that. (laughs) And, (laughs) you know, timing, it's all about timing. It is always about timing. But speaking of timing, what is it that you guys are doing and what is it that you do exactly with True Crime Excess? Well, uh, right now I'm the I'm the host and the producer, co-producer, I guess, the Wrangler. Um, I'm also one of the body hunters. Uh, so what we're doing is we went back to the case of Israel Keys. That's our first case, our first season. We were able to track down what we think are his common body disposal locations. So we're laying out that investigation in about a 20-part podcast season. And uh, the season finale is July 3rd. We're actually going to announce what he was doing with the bodies. And nobody knows. Like, only, like, the five of us know. And we actually, we're pretty sure we're right. We're pretty sure we have found where he's uh, been putting the bodies over the years. And we, he was one of those cases where a lot of people attach adjectives to him. Never a real nickname. You know, you say Israel Keys and people in true crime know who Israel Keys is. Sure. What story they know about him varies on the source of their material. Because he's an interesting, like, one-off. Like, a lot of people do an episode on Israel Keys. And there's a couple of podcasts that have taken deeper dives. Um, And there's one, like, long-running podcast. And actually, that podcast, if it had come to the conclusions we had come to, my podcast would not exist. The only reason we ended up doing this season and focusing on Israel Keys is because we were like, how do people not know this? Um, it was one of those things where I bet we went through 5,000 missing persons cases in the U.S. over a period of several years. And one of the folks that I work with goes by Meg, and she does a lot of work on just missing persons cases. It's actually not her forte to do a serial killer case, but she did have the background to help me vet a lot of research and a lot of information in what I call collapse time. Like I could hand her a case or a case file or a description. She would go like run it down and give me like a synopsis or a rundown of what she thought happened. Missing persons cases in the U S like there's a lot of what we call vanishes. And if you go on like namus.gov, which is not a completely comprehensive list, but if you put that together with NCIC and a couple of other resources, you'd come to realize there's about 20,000 long-term missing persons cases in the U.S. I think namus would say somewhere between 16 and 17,000. Well, is there, what's the date range on that? That goes, well, the earliest ones are back in 1904. Oh, wow. It goes, okay. So, it goes so way back. worth. Okay. But that's people in like 2010 putting them in, if that makes sense. They're just collecting them all in this database. Exactly. Well, when we started looking at it, the only years we were interested in were about 1992 to the killer's death in 2012. Well, actually not even his death. He died in December, 2012, but we stopped looking around March, 2012 when he was arrested down in Texas. And we eventually came to sort of a consensus that we didn't need to focus on 92 to 96. So we started looking at around 1996 and he would have been 18 years old. So we started there and we went all the way forward to 2012 and we came up with a pretty comprehensive list of about 400 cases that needed to be looked at really closely. And they weren't all missing persons cases. Some of them were 
arson homicides. Some of them were accidental deaths. Um, some of the missing persons cases weren't missing like they thought there was a victim of a crime involved. They were like lost or injured hiker type cases. And we got out into all these remote areas. And over the last two years, I've taken two trips across the country, like driving trips. And along the way, I was able to sort of map out a plan of how we could put it all together. And then the case that we are ending our season on is a 2010 case where nobody has connected Israel Keys to it. And to be honest, we're not 100% sure he is an Israel Keys victim. But what we realized with that case was so much work had gone into this 2010 case that it was more than usually abnormal that this person hadn't been found, if that makes sense. Like, there's vanishings that happen. But if you start following a path, you can tell, like, who likely went and committed suicide. You can tell who had, like, a jilted lover. You can tell who might have gone out into the woods and, like, been on like an into thin air type situation where uh, they got into a situation they didn't come home from. But this one case, it didn't make sense. And we were able to look at all of these maps, like from an overhead view of everywhere that had been searched for this case. And when we did that, we found some holes in there. And I think uh, Meg and I, and then the producer, Jamie, we all came to the same conclusion all at one time that we, we knew that he had a common body location because it's unusual. What's so unusual about Israel keys is he's a serial killer, but they have literally only recovered one body. And that's because he walked them to it. That was his, his sort of pinnacle case, Samantha Koenig. And in 2012, he abducted her from a coffee stand near his house and he, you know, raped and murdered. Then he went on a cruise, leaving her body in his driveway in a shed, mm-hmm. came back from this cruise and dismembered and disposed of her. So she was an unusual case for him, we think. Now, I, I, I have a question about that case because yeah. with all of the things that he has been described as, and he's been described as, a, you know, methodical, he's been described as... Uh, conniving, uh, a con man, yada, yada. Like, did you think that this is such a, bla- dude, you killed, you did this in public. You went into a coffee shop and abducted a woman from her job. I mean, is this not a. We <sighs> did. We, we did. We thought exactly what you're thinking right now. I, I, like, it it's just seems so, so stupid. I, it is stupid, and I think a lot of people look at that case and they go, oh, well, he did, he's not the monster that he, like, is portrayed to be. But the thing about that is he was at the end of a long cycle. And we think that case, we don't, first of all, we don't think that's his last case, but his last murder. We just think that that one is the one that essentially got him caught. We call her the dragon slayer on our board. Like, she's the one that, like, what happened and what she did and what he did after the fact ended up getting caught. Well, the big thing about her case is she's sort of the end of his decompensation. So killers go through, you know, sort of a learning curve, Mm -hmm. early phase. And that's, you know, that can be as early as their their late adol- uh, adolescent, their adole- their pre-adolescent years, They're right before puberty. They could be- I mean, not to pull it up, to- but like, he's, it's very Bundy-esque, you know? It where, is, yeah. Where, you know, and, or uh, Ed- Edmund Kemper even, where it's like you're building up to that particular breaking point and then all of a sudden shit hits the fan and you break. It is. And uh, it- I don't know. I mean, is that- He how- snapped. Yeah, okay. That, yeah, he- so- what happens there is they can't control themselves anymore. The urge overtakes them. They're essentially, you know, for, for lack of a better word, they're wearing two masks, you Mm -hmm. know, and the mask that they have put on for so long is that they're this, whatever they describe themselves to the community as. And with him, he was a father. He had a live in girlfriend. He had been in Alaska for a while. He was known as a contractor And if you asked people prior to all of this, they would have had a very average, very nonchalant response about him. 
it would not have been anything huge that he was doing. He wouldn't have been known as like some community leader or anything like Gacy. He would have been a lot like Bundy. But the snapping would have been similar to what happened to Bundy in Florida at the end of his, like when he went on his last rampage. That's what, exactly what I was thinking of. Exactly what I was thinking of. Where he was just uncontrollable. Yep. And that's what got him caught, not just because of the rampage itself, but because when you break your own rules like that, you're out of control. The mask that you put onto the community has slipped off and your mask that you think you are in in their world, that second mask is the killer mask. But underneath that mask is a monster. And like Israel Keys has been described as meticulous and he's been described as, you know, America's predator and brilliant. And he was slightly above average intelligence. He was suffering from urges to kill. And, you know, he did whatever he could to complete what he thought was an appropriate level of murder, which is really weird to say out loud. But he wasn't like a genius. He wasn't super methodical. He just made sure everything got disposed of. He was almost like a janitor of serial killers, which sounds crazy to say, but he just cleaned up after himself and when he went out to do it in the first place he sort of made sure he was very paranoid about getting caught to a degree and he wanted to make sure that people didn't know um exactly how many people he had killed he actually at the end right before he died he pulled an h.h holmes maneuver and that is i'm going to tell you the whole story and you know h.h holmes confess h.h holmes or herman mudgeon which is his real name um, he confessed to, you know, the papers, and then he wrote a book that contradicted his confession. And then we, we'll never really know what happened there because a lot of the history, and he comes up in the interviews of Israel Keys, but a lot of the history of H.H. H. Holmes is sort of being debunked slowly, but he was definitely also a monster. And I think Keys had seen, you know, Bundy and how Bundy played out in court and how Bundy had played out in, he's called it true crime bullshit, and the people around him misguided vigilantes that were, you know, sort of uh, chanting at Bundy's execution and whatnot. But Bundy did all of that to himself, and Keyes got to see it sort of in hindsight just because of his age. Mm -hmm. And I think that that part of him, he wanted to keep it from his family And then at the end, he just decided he didn't want to tell anybody because Bundy actually confessed Mm -hmm. in the last days of his life. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that was the one thing that I was always intrigued by about keys. And I mean, his, it's fascinating, horrifying, every adjective you could describe the things that he said, how much of it do you believe? Do you think he's telling the truth or, I mean, when it comes to, let's say when he would go to some area and scope out the area before he would go and supposedly commit the crime. I mean, have you found consistent evidence that backs that up? Yeah, we've found one of the lady I work with, Meg, who is probably one of the smartest people in every room. She had a problem very early on and she wanted to know if he killed anyone. And particularly after we got a hold of what he had read in terms of H.H. Holmes, which is the confusing part I was just describing, she wondered if he was just making it all up and just trying to sort of disperse the responsibility for having committed. He confessed to a single murder to start with and then added another murder to it where the bodies were never able to be fully identified. And her opinion on it was, this is either a monster or he hasn't killed anybody, and I can't tell yet and i would have to ask her right now what her opinion is of that but i think it's changed because there are just not that many vanishings in the world that can't really be tracked down i mean there's poor jurisdictional communication and law enforcement that he took advantage of and that is you know even the best unsolved cases that you can think of um a lot of times i would say like 85 90 percent of the time the cops know what happened. They just can't prove it in court. But there are like a 10% of those cases or 15% maybe where 
it's just a straight up whodunit. And Keys' cases are straight up whodunits. And the more we got into them, the deeper we dug into like the scenario you described, like the remote locations. Mm-hmm. We think we've identified about 50 potential victims in remote locations that are keys because they're really the only 50 that we've come across where nothing is ever found of them again. And there was no plan to leave the country. There was no possibility of suicide. But when a person and their backpack and all of their gear and their camping and whatnot, like equipment goes completely missing, we were able to narrow down a real specific time frame of 2002 to about 2010 with those cases in there. They're likely all him. And that was the interesting part because once we, well, once we announce it, it's going to be interesting to see how the true crime world responds to it. But once we announce the body location that ties back to those areas and other, you know, other hunting grounds, I would call them, people are going to be able to try and prove us wrong. And we knew that going into it, that like um, once we came to a conclusion and looked at like his history and we got a psycho, we had his psych evaluation, which is barely a psych evaluation. And once we had, you know, gone through all of that, we knew what he had done. We knew exactly what he had done. And the key was finding like, where did he put the remains? And everybody had different opinions at first. It was like he was using these abandoned buildings that were going to be torn down and he was putting people into lakes and he was burying them in holes in the ground. And it turns out that like he did a little bit of all of that, but that was not his preference. And towards the end of his dying, the FBI was actively searching his computers from his home and his computers from his arrest. One computer we weren't able to get like the contents of the computer were not available to us. And it was made clear they were never going to be made available to us. But we were able to get the full contents from one of those computers. And that computer was not his, but it was his girlfriend in the house. So it had a limited amount of information on it. But what it had was thousands and thousands of pictures that the FBI pulled, I don't know, maybe 50,000 pictures and then narrowed it down to a pool of like 500 by like manually sorting it by hand. And they were able to use that and compare it to the NamUs database using a program called Recognize, which is a facial recognition program. And they found 44 matches on there. And we knew that there were some victims in there. So we started, you know, dissecting that list. And it's not as many as we thought it was going to be. We figured that would be a lot more victims. But it turns out he just kept up on the news of a lot of different missing persons cases. And one of the things that he did in the cases that he read, like, actively in the newspaper, and we only have, that computer was maybe a year old. So it's only 12 months of his search history. But all of the cases had things in common. And one of those things that they happened to have in common was body locations. It would be a missing persons case. but Say there was one that like has been on a recent episode, which is Michaela Garrett. Mm-hmm. And when when JC Dugard, who was the kidnapping victim, who turned out to be alive, right? When um when she was picked up, it reignited the search for Michaela Garrett. Well, there were different people that were sort of attached as persons of interest to the Michaela Garrett case. And it turns out that uh the speed freak killers, uh, of which one killed himself right right when Keys got arrested they had basically disclosed to law enforcement that they were using an abandoned well. So Keys had, you know, all this information about these cases that were attached to them on his computer. And we were like, why is he looking there? And then later we realized that he was running out of body disposal locations. So because there were a limited number of them, we were like, he was looking for new locations to do the same thing. And that was a turning point for us. And that's ultimately the 2010 case that uh, we examine in the two-part finale, which will be June 26th and July 3rd this year. That case ties back to everything that was on his computer. It was so crazy. Can I ask you, like, yeah, like, (laughs) I mean, this is, it's so much to take in. Anybody who's never heard about this case, they're probably going, oh my gosh, what what is going on? Right. In regards to like his modus operandi, his MO, 
the way that he liked to do things. Did he have a preferred killing method? And he strangled them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He was a strangler and he was a bloodletter. So he did both. Um, he would he would put a puncture wound in the victim and then strangle them to death. But we didn't know what the puncture wound was for for a long time. And then I talked to a bunch of deer hunters and they explained to me what it was for. Uh, it's, to, it's to get all the blood to go like the direction you want it to go. This just makes me think about other cases that I've covered. In regards to that knowledge that you just tossed my way <laughs> about that, um, where in the body would that be so a couple of different places the preferred place was on the back under a shoulder blade or between the shoulder blades but that wasn't that was not every case like there were a couple of cases we found that we have not definitively linked to him because some of the cases that we're dealing with that we came across where he had been in the area they've been adjudicated otherwise so we have to be really careful in how we deal with that, uh, where there's another suspect or there's actually a, co- a, a convicted person. Um, so we found evidence that he would sometimes do a belly jab as part of his stick that he was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where it's like a gut shot with a knife, like a, like a sharp knife, but it's only like a, it's about a three, three and a half inch blade that he's using. So it's a real small blade but the type of blade he was using doesn't really have any other use. You're really only going to do so many things with it. But the big one was to like to cut and bloodlet. Go ahead. The reason I asked that question is because the case that I originally covered in, in my first podcast series was about Amy Mahalovic and she was 10 and she died from extenuation and basically, you know, she bled out and her wounds were on you know that area of the neck and that just i've always wondered if that person was connected to the because where her body was found would have been you would have had to been one aware of where it was and people who were down in that area were generally hunters so i'm assuming that that's a kind of is that a common hunting technique it is okay it's a it's a it's a it's a hunting technique i wouldn't limit it to just hunters but that's the place that you would find it uh, most frequently applied to animals. And it's something that if someone were learning how to prepare meat, they would, they would know how to do that. Like in the early stages of preparing meat, not like at a garbage a, but preparing meat like post kill, they would be learning how to do that. And it w- it's basically to, what it does is it, <clears throat> it rapidly drops the body temperature in a way that the meat won't spoil, if that makes sense. I'm not necessarily saying that in terms of like the murder part of it, but I'm, I am saying that in terms of like hunting, like that's what you're doing is you're trying to make it so that you don't spoil the meat by the meat saying too warm, too long. Interesting. Now that like as a northerner, as a city boy, <laughs> uh, I have to totally acknowledge my um, lack of knowledge <laughs> on that, well, on that front. Well, so like the Amy Mahalovic case, like I've looked at that a little bit. It wasn't anything that's going to be connected to this guy or anything like that. No, 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 no. So I had looked at it from the perspective of, you know, a Southern boy. And I did have similar thoughts to all that. I haven't, I have not delved as deeply into it as you have and Mm -hmm. as some of the other folks around that have. To me, it was just one of those like horrible, I I have trouble with cases involving children. Like it's the hardest thing for me to do. I know that's normal, but on the, on the, podcast stuff i can barely even talk about like the the keys cases that are probably keys that are kids right um you know it's just one of those things and that's you know i have a i have a teenager right now so it's compounded by that as well but yeah it's it is it's not a super common thing to know that hunters do certain things to preserve the meat so to speak that was one of the first things that stood out to me in his like competency review for court where the psychiatrist had taken like some handwritten notes for a couple of pages. Um, He was talking about as a teenager getting busted for shoplifting and the way he described it, I was like, this is like an 18 year old kid, but he wasn't his shoplifting bust. He was 13 turning 14 and he had left the family home 
and they had some land and this is out in the Oregon. I think it's Oregon. It's either Oregon or, or Washington. Like there's two little places there that he suddenly moved. No, it's Washington. Sorry about that. He moves to Oregon a little later. So in Washington, they had land where he had gone into the woods and built himself like a little 200 square foot cabin. And that's where he was living. Unabomber like. <laughs> yeah, it was very Unabomber like. And he had been, you know, stealing shit from the neighbors. He had been going in and taking their guns and, you know, taking other supplies. And when he got caught shoplifting, his parents threw a fit about the shoplifting and they made him move back in and they took all his stuff from his house or his little cabin. And that's when they found the guns from the neighbors. So he, they made him return all the guns to the neighbors and he did some stuff, uh, chopping wood and other stuff to kind of make up the difference for the guns he'd gotten rid of. But what was so interesting about that is they had no problem with him poaching on the land killing and preparing deer at the same age. This is somebody who was killing and preparing, you know, white-tailed deer at 13. You know, so he's field dressing and going through the garbage process of deer and giving them to his family illegally, not, you know, on any kind of permit, not with a tag. So doing that, they were bent out of shape about the misdemeanor shoplifting, but they didn't care about the felony poaching. <laughs> he, it confused him very early on. He was like, I don't, you know, I didn't know what to think about that. They were okay with the deer when I brought them the meat and put it in the fridge. Yeah, mixed messages. I mean, nature versus nurture on that one. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is definitely a monster that was made. And this is a monster that was manufactured by other hands. This is not like a, a killer that came out of the world. This week's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients, and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. This summer, HelloFresh is here to take the work out of eating well. Reach your goals with delicious, calorie-smart, and protein-smart lunch and dinner options, plus new vegan recipes, too. HelloFresh makes entertaining easy with a selection of crowd-pleasing eats, like their bratwurst bar with caramelized onions, Dijonese slaw, and pineapple relish, or a snack board with pretzel bites, spiced bar nuts, and hot honey peach jam. So go to HelloFresh.com slash WhoKilled16 and use the code WhoKilled16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash WhoKilled16 and use WhoKilled16 for 16 meals plus free shipping oh, that's interesting that's interesting to think because you would think somebody with and i don't want to say pedigree because that makes it sound like he's got some sort of resume but with the things that he's been connected to you would think that he would have been like that you know he would have been that kid that was pulling the wings off of flies as a five-year-old and well the earliest incidents we have we have this bizarre set of cases in 1992 where these two boys are um accused of and not him it's like people that live near him are accused of mutilating all these animals and they fess up to a couple of them except they're like we don't know what happened to those other animals and they get the book thrown at them and the case is closed in juvenile mm -hmm. court and everything's sealed but we don't know the outcome of it. We just know that the statements that were made were that these two boys didn't do all of them. So Meg went mm. back and looked at the time and the location to Key's property and to like where his family was living. And her thinking is that that's the early signs of Key's, these animal mutilations that occurred. But what is weird about that is that he would have been – smart enough to know that he could get away with it because somebody else is going to be blamed. Okay. That's a big, that's a big theme for us, by the way. Okay. We, we have numerous times and places where we think he did something nearby because I, because I get some flack for saying it that way. I have numerous times and places that I have tracked him to an area, to a potential victim, to a keys like taking and disappearance where something else like it was recently in the news. For instance, up by you, the guy that 
took Knight and DeBerry. Uh, Ariel, uh, Ariel, yeah, Ariel Castro. Ariel Castro. Okay. So I have a keys case up by you. I'm not 100% sure, but I have this random thing where he's in Cleveland briefly. And it's Ashley Summers, by the way. Really? Yeah. And I'm not 100% sure, but it's like high on my list. But the reason is those other disappearances were in the papers briefly. And I think he saw them. Do you know what I mean? Do you know the order of events there? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely do. And I, I, see, where you're, I see where you're going with that. He, he's so being... it was one of my theories that he was like picking areas where something else was already happening because he felt like it would be lumped in with the other thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like what Zodiac was doing. If he, if he wasn't really committing those crimes, he was taking credit for crimes that he didn't actually commit. It's just, it's a little different way of doing it, but it's still the same thing. Gosh, he's, so, <laughs> he's such a mystery. He really is. The whole thing is just, it's so crazy. I mean. Well, with us, like, we, we didn't care about him that much. We, we did have to research the hell out of him. And we did over the last, I'd say, we actually came to the conclusion we came to a, a while ago. But I would say over the last five years, uh, our obsession with knowing more about him grew because our concern was the victims. We have a thing about like people who don't get brought home. And we know we can't bring every single missing person in the world home, but we felt like this was a group of cases that were all connected. If we could mm-hmm. figure them out, we could close all those cases out. And that's what drove us. You know, we started with Danielle Imbo and Richard Patron out of Pennsylvania. And we were trying to disprove that he did it. Now, we don't know if he did on some of these. And this is one of them. It's on his computer. It's a couple missing from Pennsylvania. His timing is weird. Like, he's not really anywhere while that's going on that makes sense. And we started there. And I was just asking questions of the others who have helped me. I was like, how do you guys think this case went down? And, you know, one of them came back and they said, oh, it's a hit. It's the ex-husband doing a hit with his cop buddies. And I was like, no, it doesn't feel like a hit. And one of the others came back and they were like, oh, that's a, that's a carjack. And then one of the others came back and they were like, oh, have you looked at Israel Keys? <laughs> and I was like, I was, that's what I was just doing. So we started talking about it and Meg got the most engaged the quickest. There's been other people that have been helping, but she was the one who was like, oh, I will totally go down this road with you because I, I like closing this in person's cases, even if it's just in my head. And like, She's got pet cases that are completely unrelated to Israel Keys that she does along the way. Like, she is very interested in Brian Schaefer, which is up by you. It's and a very she- popular case with my buddies from True Crime Garage, and they're very much a part of trying to find answers on that case. Well, she, um, she never shared this with anybody, but at one point, she did this big statistical analysis of all the unidentified persons in NamUs and state databases. And there was only one that matched Bryant. And it was over in Detroit, Michigan. It was from an arson fire like a year later. And she was like, that has got to be Brian Schaefer's body. She's never shared it with anybody. But like, you know, she spent months going through the minutia of that case. This is a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And so when she was coming on board and saying, hey, I'm interested in and what you're doing with Israel Keys, I was very excited because she's sort of the opposite of me. Like I, I am just driven to finish a thing. I want to know a thing. I want to get, I don't care like how we get there. I'm not going to make a path. I'm not going to try and reverse construct it. You know, I'm not going to do like anything weird with evidence, but I want to know like the end result and I will run as many miles as I have to, to get there. But with her, everything's got to have a reason. She's, she's like checking off some of these things that I do. And she looks at it and she's like, I don't think you're right about this thing. Do you mind if I talk to you about it? And I know that's going to mean a 10 hour or 12 hour conversation <laughs> over text message and phone. And at the end of it, she's going to say, I still think you're wrong, <laughs> but, but you can say it if you want to, I'm going to let you say it. <laughs> but she has been like one of, she is, she is literally my Sherlock Holmes. And she always has been like, we've known each other. We're coming up on, um, we're over 30 years. I know that. And, you know, she in, in our teens became my, my Sherlock Holmes person and our kids hang out, our spouses know each other, like our, all of our families are intermingled at holidays and stuff. And I just trust her implicitly. So there's been a few of them. She's come back finally and she's like, I think that you were right on this other case, you know, even though you're wrong on this other seven, 
you write on this one thing that you did. And I'm like, okay. And she'll listen to the podcast now and she'll call me. She's like, that was an okay episode. Would you like something for next week? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I have new things I can give you. Yeah. You know, they have a good way of uh, reminding us of uh, our shortcomings. But uh, yeah, that's, you know, the partnership there, that's definitely something that's got to be beneficial for, you know, one research and two kind of keeping you focused on, like you said, keep it, you know, getting it done, but there is a little bit of a special touch to it. And oh yeah. She, she had plans. Um, originally she was going to do a missing persons podcast and I don't know what the name of it was or anything. And she asked me to come in on that, but she wanted to focus on an archival missing persons podcast where you took, say it's January 1st and you did every case of January 1st on other years. She didn't care how long the podcast was. If it was mm. 10 hours she, from January 1st, 1904 to January 1st of now 2020, she wanted to do every case from that day. And I think she got frustrated with the lack of cooperation from, you know, various agencies and entities. It's really hard to track some of those cases down. Yeah. And then not everybody and everybody's different. You know, that's the one thing that you don't realize as, as a, just a listener or whatever. It's like, okay, you can put out an FOA, FOI FOIA request to a certain police department and they'll get back to you in a day. Some people yep. never get back to you. Some people get back to you and say, give us $150 for it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like, that's, what? You know, the, the copying fees even vary. And like, I had one case in Texas and my, my whole group, particularly my partner, Jamie, and um, my kid got the biggest kick because they sent me the wrong name. I paid a lot of money for this file. And I, I don't remember the exact name, but like one of them was Stephanie and the other one was Joy. And I was so careful in the request and so careful on the phone. And um, I knew one of them had dragged on for many, many, many years and sort of been closed and reopened elsewhere. And I wanted, I really wanted this case file. And I waited and I waited right before the podcast was going up. They, they said they were sending it to me and it was this much money and I need to pay for it. So I paid for it and it gets here. And it's the opposite person. I had wanted the Joy one, and this was Stephanie's case. And I was just like, oh, I, I can't use this. And I just had gone around. It was a really small department down there. And I thought that I had this lady just wrapped around my finger. But she heard, you know, uh, looking into a missing persons case. And she was like, that case is closed. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't know how to express to her that, like, the one I was looking for wasn't. And it just went round and round. And I, I happened to have gone down to that area last year looking for Brandon Lawson. Somebody in the group, and also Meg had a theory, they had given me directions to this spot they had found on some geospatial intelligence maps, like satellite maps. And they were like, can you please just go check this one thing out? Because we think this thing in the field is outside of the search area for Brandon Lawson, but we think it's bones. So I went down there and it was on private land in Texas. And I was like, I, I got about, you know, 200 yards out and I like walked over to where they wanted me to go look. And it was covered in low lying cacti. Mm. And I was like, I think I got to go. And sure enough, man, there were like people coming down this little road. And I was like, I wonder what's going to happen if I stand here for a minute. And all I heard was, get out of here. And that was oh. it for me. I was like, I'm done. I was like, I'm done with this one. Because I, yeah. I don't know anything about Texas and I don't want to be caught down there. I don't either. I mean, I know just from the research that I've done, but I will say that, uh, yeah, you made the right choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you drive down there, like the drive there was so crazy. Cause I was actually working on something else right before that, where I was in California. Oh. So I, I drove across and sort of detoured to go do it in the first place. And like, I, I was out, I don't know if you know, like, uh, the bear. So area of California or Joshua tree park or any of those that's, I was down there. I'm not as familiar with it as other parts of California, but it's like the desert from the movies. Okay. So I was driving from there and all of a sudden I get to Texas. And I was like, finally some people turns out that's not the case in Texas. All you see is windmills and oil derricks for miles. Yeah. I went to school at the university of Utah and, uh, okay. Drove route 80 to salt Lake. And once you, once you go past Des Moines, it's pretty much, it's pretty bad after that. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're very familiar with that area then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, uh, it's, it's made appearances on many of my shows that uh, my dorm was next to the dorm where uh, Ted Bundy did live. So <laughs> That's so crazy. Now, granted, it was 20 years apart, but hey, still, still the same dorm. Yeah, it is. It's the same landmark. Yeah, it's crazy. 
crazy. So <laughs> where are you guys going with the, uh, with the whole show? I mean, I, I know you guys are focusing on Israel Keys this season. What do you think that you guys are going to be doing uh, going forward? Once we announced like the body location, that is done. Like our part in that is done. Um, so there's this guy, Christopher Below, that most people haven't heard of. And then there's um, Neil Falls. And I had taken a look at Scott, Scott Lee Kimball, Scott Kimball. And he's still alive. That was my main interest. So is Christopher Below. He's actually about to get out of uh, prison for an attempted murder charge. I'm pretty sure he killed about six girls. So without going into a lot of detail on him, if you look up Christopher Below disappeared girls or missing girls, I think I'm going to have to do him next for season two because I've been doing the research along the way. My original plan with him was not to do a podcast. It wasn't actually to do a podcast about keys. If the FBI had been interested, I was just going to quietly help find the bodies of keys victims and move on. Um, and then it turns out they, that case is closed for them. So I, that's what got me into keys. But what's interesting about below is he's about to get out on parole. So I think that, uh, I think that someone needs to look at some of the research I've got. And I think the best way to do that is a podcast. So he may be the next one up for season two, because I have so many hours of him and, um, he's one of these guys that was, you know, sort of a prototypical like Bundy type serial killer. Uh, and I mean, you know, young girls, 16 to 25 year old girls. There's a couple exceptions, but uh, I can't find the bottom of his yet, but about six months from now, I should be able to. So I'll probably come back next year and be doing his story. That'll be very interesting. Yeah. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool. I, uh, I definitely think that you've picked some really interesting cases and you've obviously done deep deep dive into this case <laughs> we've done a lot uh, of work on <laughs> yeah uh and then i mean just to hear you talking about going and looking for brandon lawson and i mean knowing that case and how crazy that case is and well and, her theory there was that the searchers had interpreted what he was saying in the 911 call wrong and yeah. then then when meg got involved she was like that's completely what happened and she actually she said i i'm between two fields and like came up with this whole explanation that she sent to me with a video, like explaining to me how to get from where he was to where he would have ended up based on the 911 call. And uh, then his brother came out with a statement. And when he came out with a statement, she said, that's totally what I was thinking. So why don't you go look? And I was like, okay, well, (laughs) and now I can't not look. So (laughs) it was just one of those things where like, if we can find him, you know, it closes, but it's one less thing. Do you feel uh, like you, you are uh, very prone to Pandora's box? <laughs> oh yeah, man. I, I, um, I, I like, I talk about the Texas thing because I was a little scared, like going on a private property in a place where people openly carry their guns so much. Um, but I'm not really that. like, uh, one of the folks was asking me like, what are you going to do? Like at these remote locations that you guys are going to, and I was like, I got a dog, I got a Rottweiler. And then, you know, they were like, are you carrying guns? I'm I'm just not a gun person. And I've been carrying a bat and a knife. And that's part of my Pandora's box. But the other one is, I can't stand to see a puzzle that, like, is missing a couple pieces. I really want to know where they were. Yeah, you you sound like that guy. That you just wouldn't be able to (laughs) let anything go. Like, you don't want to lose something in John's house. If you're John, you don't want to be losing anything because he'll never give up. And he'll probably drive your family nuts. (laughs) Yep. And I find a lot of that stuff, so I have to find bigger and bigger challenges, you know? And that's how we end up places like this. <laughs> wow. So, so out of the team, there's you, and then and who are we the have, other players? We there? have Meg. Oh, okay. We have Jamie, and we have Nick. And then there's a couple of folks who've asked, like, to, they work on other stuff, and they keep their anonymity. There's two other people. They, sure. don't, they don't reveal their, their – uh, we call one of them John as well, which is close enough. Gotcha. Um, uh, we leave the names out of it. Meg actually hates that her name is being used right now. She was like, she's like, I can't believe you did that to me. It's like, you could have told me. And I was like, nobody knows it's your real name. If, if you don't say anything, they won't know. And she was like, but people might know my voice. And I'm like, well, and she uh. said, she's, she's come to terms with it. She, she actually likes that we're doing it finally. And something is, you know, coming to a completion. Yeah. And I think that what you said about the podcast, I mean, I think 
your feelings on the podcast medium are probably the same feelings that I have. I think that with the way that there is no such thing as print media anymore, I mean, it's there, but it's minimal. There aren't long form storytelling. You know, journalists don't really take, take deep dives unless they're writing a book or now it's doing a podcast. So I think it's fabulous that people who are very intrigued by puzzles and finding answers like yourself and I think I fall into that same category and a lot of true crime listeners as well. I just think that that's the best medium that you could find at this present moment that tells the story and allows people to take it in whenever they want. I just think it's the future. Oh, it, it, it absolutely is. It's, it's a future of true crime reporting to some degree. And I, I would say there's two alternatives and that is like your traditional news special you know like the date lines of the world but that's small that's a little bit of content it's not a lot it's a lot of work to get a little bit of content yeah. and the other alternative is like murder documentaries that's what i actually I, I told jamie and more specifically i told meg i was like they see you guys and they hear what you're talking about producers are going to want to put you on film talking about this stuff because this is so interesting and you guys are so good looking that like it's going to be a thing I was like, so why don't you just let me do the podcast instead? You know, Jamie's more of the creative. She's not into the true crime. I mean, she listens to it, but she's not as into it as Meg and I are. Um, and the other John is a podcast person, but not a true crime podcast person. Um, they're more on the research side of things. Sure. And so I told him, I was like, you know, I think this is the way to go. And I think this is the window to get in. It's, so we started right before the quarantine, which is interesting. So we had two or three episodes out and then suddenly things were shutting down and there was a big dip on our fourth and fifth episode, but then it came right back up and we haven't even started. Our advertising starts. Well, this will be the first of that. Yeah. And, you know, and then we start ramping up like onto some of the, like the bigger podcasts in the mm -hmm. true crime world that sure. starts in like two months when they're coming up on the finale. Wow. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you and I can hook up again because I really want to tell you the ending. Yeah, for sure. No, and, and and I think that like that's the thing about true crime podcasters is what I've learned is we're all out to help each other out. I think we all want answers to certain crimes. I like to say that I provide a voice for the voiceless, you know, whatever tagline you want to use. But it, it is the unsolved cases and the people that don't have answers are the cases that intrigue me yeah. i'm not so much intrigued by the murder of the week type thing i mean i'll still right. do like a murder of the week but i still like to focus on somewhat of an advocacy role and hopefully that somebody listens and somebody can go oh i know that this sounds familiar and then you know that's why it's like always important that i provide the numbers for the cases that i cover and i just think that we as podcasters have a job that's not just to entertain people but it's also to form but do it in a way that's respectful to the families and respectful yeah. to the people that that have been affected by these crimes because they get so overlooked in a lot of these cases yeah this is the first time that my straddling the fence has been a positive because i have to mention some of these cases and some of them are not tightly tied to this overall case but that's what was happening that week that's what was happening that month that's what was happening that year and you know if it popped up in the headlines and this guy saw it i'm going to talk about it because mm -hmm. to me there's very few exceptions to this but most of these cases where the people have never been found and there's no resolution they need to be resolved and people may not even know they need to be resolved like people close to it and some of them have told me they do not want their case to come to light because it's going to reopen a bunch of old wounds and all of those are left out you know i left those particular cases out because i don't want to hurt them no and I, yeah and i i believe in definitely taking things with kid gloves and treating things with proper care and i think that everything especially in this you know in this industry yeah. genre it's just basically be respectful uh these people have been through a hell of a lot more than you have and they know a lot more about pain than you do not to say that the person interviewing you hasn't for pain i mean we all have it's just remember where you are and who you're talking to whenever you're talking to somebody that's, like, that's yeah. just like my advice to any podcaster is just be respectful yeah, I totally agree with that. And I th that's my old school journalism <laughs> rant there, you know. <laughs> yeah, but it's a, it's a good way to look at it, though. It really is. If you're just respectful and, you know, be kind as much as you can. I'm not into an area where, like, my suspect is dead. The next one is not. But this one that I'm dealing with right now, he's dead. 
never convicted of anything. So I'm even trying to be respectful to his family. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't talk, I didn't talk to them. I haven't bothered the kids or the siblings or any of that for this case. Cause I, I didn't want it to, you know, rehash a bunch of old wounds for them. That's gotta be hard yeah. to have been in his family, you know? You're so right about straddling the fence and, and trying to keep things copacetic on both sides of the of the table. I mean, it really is difficult to do and it's impressive to be able to pull it off. And I think that, I think with your show, you're doing it. And I think that obviously you guys are going to be successful with your huge news that you have coming out. And I'm needless to say, waiting with bated breath. <laughs> <laughs> for, for that day is there anything that you would like my listeners to know and how would they get a hold of you or subscribe to your podcast uh you can find us on all your major podcasting services and on our website at truecrimexs.com excellent excellent and when's Come the next episode coming out uh we have an episode dropping on like thursday night friday morning it, every episode technically drops on thursday night but most people don't hear it till friday all right. Well, I will be uh, dropping this the same day. So take a listen. And uh, again, if you have anything else uh, that you would like to share, I am uh, I'm listening. So well, they, I just want to tell you, thank you for doing this. This is I, I've listened to what you've done and you have found a very interesting niche being able to cover cases and being able to talk to other content creators. I think it's fantastic what you're doing. Just wanted to say that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I, I definitely, I feel like my podcasting's evolved from the day one. <laughs> and, if, and, you know, I mean, obviously you get better at what you do, but I think just my perspective on what it is that we're doing, I was just saying about the advocacy, you feel pressure to do it right. And I think that that's important. And I think if you have people that don't necessarily treat it properly it can be taken the wrong way like you don't care and there's so much humor in this industry that people are using to let off steam that is um i think it's complicated to explain that mechanism but it's another place that i think you straddle the fence well with trying to make sure that the focus stays on the advocacy and on the case facts and on what's going on but it stays just light and casual enough that it's not this forced broadcast thing and i, I like that part of what you're doing yeah, and I, I try to keep it that way, but I don't know. I just think there's a lot of d different podcasts out there that, hey, everybody's got their own way of going about it. I've evolved. Everybody evolved. Um, <laughs> we all it, have to it, evolve it, eventually. It, it, it is what it is. Yeah, trust me. Yeah, I know. I think this whole thing, the podcasting, the true crime family, the true crime community, the people that are out there trying to provide answers, I think that is great. And John, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. And uh, Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, man. And all the hard work that you've put into uh, providing answers to these, these families. I think it's just invaluable. Know that you're appreciated. And I think every listener that's listening should be currently subscribing to True Crime XS. Again, thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you guys for tuning into this week's episode featuring True Crime XS. And thank you to True Crime XS for this week's sponsorship. Please go and subscribe if you haven't already. As you heard in the interview, there are some really exciting things happening in the Israel Keys case, and they are digging deep. I would also like to thank all of you guys for taking the time to help build both shows' audiences. As a reminder, I drop new episodes of Who Killed every Friday, and that's wherever you get your podcasts. And since Season 2 of My Passion Case is on hiatus temporarily, I drop those every Monday, wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And season two will feature guests such as Sarah Turney from Voices for Justice, Libby German of the Delphi case, as well as True Crime Files, Evidence Locker, Naptime Nancy, and many, many more. And for the second year in a row, I will be representing Who Killed? Who Killed Amy Mahalovic and My Passion Case on Podcast Row at CrimeCon 2020. It's definitely a bucket list item for any true crime fanatic. The new dates are now October 30th through November 1st. If you would like to save on your ticket, I can help with that. You can use my promo code AMY2020. And again, that's AMY2020. If you enjoy this podcast and my other shows, you can help support 
independent journalism by clicking on the donate button on the left hand side of slowburnmedia.com that is slow minus the w you can also contribute to the show via the venmo app with my username at bill huffman three i will also provide a link in the show notes every contribution really does help keep these slow burn podcasts running You can also help support the show by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Those five stars actually help keep these cases that I cover in the spotlight. If you have any information regarding any of the cases I've covered, you can contact the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. And the same goes for anything regarding Israel Keys. The number is 1-800-CALL. FBI. If you would like to stay up to date on the cases I have covered, as well as updates on those cases and new shows that I have in the pipeline, please follow me on Twitter at BillHuffman3. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel, and that is Slow Burn Media Podcasts. Thank you guys again so much for listening. Until next time, be safe and be healthy. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Sheree Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures. Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman.